I don't know why I didn't do this before, but I just read the preface to the Bible translation done by America's most famous lexicographer, Noah Webster. Did you even know he made a Bible translation? Yes, sir, he did in 1833. It was called on the title page, The Holy Bible Containing the Old and New Testaments in the Common Version. By that, he means the King James, with amendments of the language. So it wasn't a translation, it was a revision. The Bible is a large book. Amending its language is an immense task, one I've both contemplated and quailed at for many years myself. Why did Webster amend the language of the King James Version? He explains in his preface, and I am overjoyed and ashamed at the same time to say that Webster made in 1833 exactly the same argument I have been making since around 2015. I'm overjoyed to find an important ally. I'm ashamed, however, because I sort of thought I had a brilliant new idea. Nope, I was almost two centuries late. You just have to hear this. It's incredible. Webster comes within a millimeter of naming false friends. I've shared a bit of this before on my blog, I think maybe on my YouTube channel, but I've never read the whole preface to his KJV update. I want to take you through it and then through some of his specific examples of linguistic change between 1611 and 1833. Noah Webster is the legendary American lexicographer, dictionary maker, whose 1828 dictionary is still used, in fact, used and trusted by a fair number of people who love and read the King James Bible, even exclusively. Webster produced his KJV update roughly halfway between the birth of the King James and today, about right here. Why did he do this? He explains, in the lapse of two or three centuries, changes have taken place which, in particular passages, impair the beauty and, in others, obscure the sense of the original languages. Webster has his eye not just on meaning, which is what I tend to focus on, but literary quality, aesthetics. He thinks language change over the 222 years since the publication of the King James Version have marred both meaning and beauty. He gets a bit more specific about meaning, and listen to how he carefully distinguishes the kinds of problems that language change causes for contemporary readers. You're going to hear him talk about exactly the same things I talk about, dead words and false friends. Some words have fallen into disuse, he says, and the signification of others in current popular use is not the same now as when they were introduced into the version. The effect of these changes is that some words are not understood by common readers who have no access to commentaries and who will always compose the great proportion of readers. Did you hear this? Webster is defending the plowboy by saying that there are dead words in the King James, words that common readers will simply not know. He goes on to describe false friends. <laughs> Those who know my channel and my book, can you believe this? While other words being now used in a sense different from that which they had when the translation was made present a wrong signification or false ideas. Whenever words are understood in a sense different from that which they had when introduced and different from that of the original languages, Hebrew and Greek, they do not present to the reader the word of God. Wow, this is precisely, exactly, to the letter what I have been saying. Well, almost to the letter. He says, false ideas. I say false friends. He and I both recognize that words tend over time to be understood in senses different from those they had previously. And he speaks very soberly as I have tried to do, in saying that every time a false friend occurs, the reader is not getting the word of God in that place. And he anticipates and answers what I think is the strongest objection to the Webster Ward viewpoint on the King James Version, the idea that these false friends aren't all that important. This circumstance is very important, even in things not the most essential. And in essential points, mistakes may be very injurious. In my own view of this subject, a version of the scriptures for popular use should consist of words expressing the sense which is most common in popular usage, so that the first ideas suggested to the reader should be the true meaning of such words, according to the original languages. That many words in the present version, he's talking about the King James Version, fail to do this is certain. My principal aim is to remedy this evil. Wow, I am just dumbfounded. To have such an august American man of letters on my side, or rather to discover that I've been playing on his team all along, even using his playbook, it's humbling and invigorating at the same time. But Webster doesn't just speak in generalities. He gives a whole lot of specifics. 
and it's really fascinating to see the state of language change in his day. Roughly speaking, the King James Version is 400 years old. Roughly speaking, when it was only 200 years old, America's leading lexicographer saw many of the very same dead words and false friends that I have pointed out. Unless contemporary English has gone back toward Elizabethan usages, and I think I've shown repeatedly that that is not the case, we can expect that Noah Webster will see some of the same dead words and false friends that we do, but that we will see more. Or maybe, so a hypothesizer might hypothesize, most of the language change that has turned King James words into dead words and false friends happened before Webster's time or during English's journey across the Atlantic. It kind of doesn't matter. The question is what English the plowboy speaks today. And the question for Webster was about what the plowboy spoke in his day. So Webster has an introduction in which the principal alterations in the language of the common version of the scriptures made in this edition are stated and explained. In other words, when he updated the King James Version, as I myself have strongly considered doing, what were the major changes he felt he had to make in order to make the King James accessible to the plowboy? I simply cannot go through all of the ones that Webster gives, but I can pick out some highlights and encourage any nerds out there to go read Webster's introduction to his King James revision for themselves. The first two have immediate relevance to common passages of scripture. Who is substituted for which in Webster's version when it refers to persons? This is precisely why our father which art in heaven sounds a beat or two off to us. English changed between the King James and Webster, and English speakers just didn't use which as a relative pronoun to refer to persons. They used who, who had taken over this function. Remember, language changes. It's always slowly and occasionally quickly becoming something different. This is just the kind of subtle change that occurs, which to who. Likewise, its is substituted for his when it refers to plants and things without life. That's what Webster says about his version. This happens on page one, Genesis 1.11. The King James there has wording which just strikes our ears as odd. Though remember that the original audience for these words, whether we're talking about the original readers of the King James or those of the Bishop's Bible that the King James is a revision of, you know, sometimes it's hard to say, those original readers would not have heard this as odd. Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. Again, Genesis 1.11, King James. Was God talking about Tolkien's ants or Lewis's triads, living trees with spirits and personalities? No. In our English, as in Webster's, a tree is an it, not a his. So if you look at Genesis 1.11 in the Webster Bible, you'll see this. Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind. That language isn't odd. It doesn't call attention to itself. It's just what God said, translated into our and Webster's English. Look at Webster's next example. To is used for unto in his version. This latter word is not found in the Saxon books. In other words, it's not in very old English. And as it is never used in our present popular language, the language of the people, it is evidently a modern compound. The first syllable, un, adds nothing to the signification or force of two, but by increasing the number of unimportant syllables rather impairs the strength of the whole clause or sentence in which it occurs. It has been rejected by almost every writer for more than a century. He's talking about aesthetics here. Unto is one of those words that just marks you off as quoting the King James Version. But by Webster's day, it was dead and gone. By our day, it is triple dead and quadruple gone. Perhaps people don't always misunderstand it. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, I'm guessing, is reasonably transparent even today. But it adds a strong whiff of the antique mall to your quote. It makes Jesus sound like he was talking in a special religious language rather than what he did use, the language of the people. Webster substitutes why for wherefore. He uses my instead of mine. He thinks wherein, therein, whereon, thereon, and other similar compounds are not wholly obsolete, but are considered, except in technical language, inelegant. There he goes on aesthetics again. So he decided to reduce the number of them. There's no wist, wit, and wat for Webster. He uses the modern no and new. There's no more four score. 80 will do just fine in Webster's English and in ours. Kine in the King James becomes cows in Webster's revision. Here's an interesting example of language change that Webster noted. 
He updated usury in the King James to interest in his revision. He explains, usury originally signified what is now called interest, or simply a compensation for the use of money. The Jews were not permitted to take interest from their brethren for the use of money loaned. And when the Levitical law forbids the taking of usury, the prohibition intended is that of any gain or compensation for the use of money or goods. Hence, usury in the scriptures, that is in the King James, is what we call interest. The change of signification in the word usury, which now denotes unlawful interest, renders it proper to substitute interest for usury. Do you see? Webster is saying that usury used to just mean interest, the legitimate practice of charging money for the use of money. I should say legitimate outside Israel. But it had come in his day to mean unlawful or exorbitant interest. It was no longer an accurate translation of the Hebrew in many places. This is so great. Webster also picked up quite a number of my false friends. Coast in the King James becomes border in his translation. I did a video on that one. Meat becomes food in his translation. I did a video on that one too. I did it right over there. You can't see. Be careful for nothing in the King James becomes be anxious for nothing. I talked about this false friend in my book, Authorized the Use and Misuse of the King James Bible. I also talked somewhere about carriage and quicken and fray and conversation, spoil and Holy Ghost, all false friends that Webster brings up. Webster says, for example, the word ghost is now used almost exclusively for an apparition, except in this phrase, Holy Ghost. I have therefore uniformly used Holy Spirit. Webster mentions a few false friends I've wanted to talk about but haven't gotten to, like offend, which I just saw some King James preachers misunderstanding yesterday in online discussion. He talks about strange and provoke, which I've noticed and wanted to talk about. He talks about the way the King James translators used against, which I pointed out to a King James only YouTube commenter this very day as I record. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. What does against mean? That usage of against is so obviously a misfit in our English that it's hard to call it misleading. It's just meaningless for contemporary speakers. It's just static. Webster also talks about of, one I've touched on a bit that I just haven't dug into because it's just so huge. He says, in the use of this word, a great change has taken place since the King James was made. Its original signification is from, but in present use in the scriptures, it is equivalent in many passages to concerning, in many others to by, and others to from, and in some passages, its signification is, at first view, ambiguous. Thus, to be sick of a thing like sick of the palsy, is generally understood to mean to be disgusted with it or tired of it. I'm sick of this palsy. But to be sick of a fever or of love in scripture is to be affected by it as the cause. In the latter sense, I have substituted with for of. He goes into great detail about of, too much for this video. Interestingly, Webster caught by and by in the middle of its journey from meaning immediately as it did when the King James has Salome demanding the head of John the Baptist by and by on a charger, which is another false friend, to its current meaning, which is after a while or eventually. In Webster's day, kind of in between, the word meant soon but not immediately. Webster picks this up. Webster is more delicate than I was, though I have to say I found it very difficult to make my bad words in the King James video. I just found I had to do it. Ass, piss, bowels, whore, etc. He just won't name the bad words in the King James, but his observation is so wise and so on the mark almost 200 years later. Many words and phrases in the King James are so offensive, especially to females, as to create a reluctance in young persons to attend Bible classes in schools, in which they are required to read passages which cannot be repeated without a blush, and containing words which, on other occasions, a child could not utter without rebuke. The effect is to divert the mind from the matter, that is the subject matter, to the language of the scriptures, and thus, in a degree, frustrate the purpose of giving instruction. Have you not seen this, you who've used the King James in church? You just know that the teens will titter if you make them read, and she lighted off her ass. You'd better not have them do it. It's funny and ironic and sad and interesting that there is at least one false friend in Webster's own introduction. Can you hear it? Listen to him.
In no respect does the present version, the King James, require amendments more than in the use of many words and phrases which cannot now be uttered, especially in promiscuous company, without violence to decency. What is promiscuous company? Today, this would mean reading the Bible out loud to loose women and guys who are players. In Webster's day, promiscuous company could mean consisting of assorted parts or elements grouped or massed together without order, mixed and disorderly in composition or character, with plural noun, of various kinds mixed together. The OED says this is now archaic and rare. No duh. I've certainly never heard the word promiscuous used this way. Webster speaks with even more wisdom noting that even in his day, parents had to tell kids which Bible chapters to read and which to avoid because they would cause problems with their earthy or offensive language. Don't mind the mosquitoes. He said in 1833, to retain such offensive language in the popular version is, in my view, injudicious, if not unjustifiable, for it gives occasion to unbelievers and to persons of levity, people who want to make fun of the Bible, to cast contempt upon the sacred oracles or call in question their inspiration. And this weapon is used with no inconsiderable effect. Overall, Webster talks about a dozen, dozen different dead words and false friends in his introduction to his King James Revision. I find it, of course, unutterably sad that I have to say all the same stuff he said so eloquently back then, back when I was negative 147 years old. I don't need to add reflections and interpretations to this video. Just an exhortation, a brief one. If you don't believe me, you don't trust me, you think I've spent thousands of dollars of my own money on YouTube equipment and thousands of minutes of my free time on a quixotic endeavor, well then, trust the guy whose name is literally on the dictionary. The OG word nerd said the same stuff I say.